and from the decay of radioactive elements like thorium and uranium that what? Today we're going to be looking at another one of Kurt Gazat's videos. Specifically, deep biosphere. There's something hiding inside Earth. Like what? Majin Buu? For those of you who don't know me, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry. From engineering operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Let's check this out. We've found a new planet, home to octillions of the most extreme beings octillions. living in the most absurd and deadly hellscape. In absolute darkness, crushed by the weight of mountains, starved of oxygen, cooked alive, bathed in acid, salt or radiation. And yet, they live for thousands, perhaps millions of years. It turns out, this planet is not in space, it's inside the crust of Earth. This is the deep biosphere. Which is technically in space, but sure. And we basically learned that it exists yesterday. Its volume is at least twice as large as all the Earth's oceans, home to more microbes than the rest of the entire planet. I was going to say, they said, I'm going to say octillion is big. That's 10 to the 27th power, and the amount of atoms in an adult human body is on the order of octillions. So, it's a lot. The total biomass is more than 20 times greater than all humans, That's livestock, and looking. animal wildlife. <laughs> Let's descend into this mad, deadly world where none of the rules we thought are mandatory for life apply. Going deeper and deeper. That's a cool effect. Deep life seems to be everywhere we look. Below the oceans, near volcanoes, beneath the glaciers of Antarctica, under any landscape we can imagine, cool. and anywhere we live. We'll use a special duck science drill and start our journey in familiar territory. On land... This reminds me of that movie, The Core. In the soil, where plants grow and animals roam. If Earth were an onion, this is the very top of the very top <laughs> layer. Onion. Soil is a lavish four-way partnership of air, water, minerals and organic matter bathed in endless energy. Life lives in luxury here. Plants exploit this paradise and produce more than 30 times the biomass of all of Earth's animals each year in a constant cycle of growth and decay. What's interesting is a lot of people bring up renewables in the discussion of clean energy. Well, over half of that is biomass, so essentially burning wood and plant matter, which isn't exactly clean, but it is renewable. There's a common misconception about that, that all renewables are clean, which just isn't the case. Only a tiny fraction of the biomass is buried deeper in the ground, supplying juicy resources for almost half a billion years. As we dig deeper, most of the air has been squeezed out, and we cross the water table into a zone saturated with groundwater, rich in minerals, and some organic matter. Roots from the most ambitious plants... Getting into groundwater reminds me of that silly movie, The China Syndrome, how they talked about radioactive fuel getting so hot that not only did it melt through the reactor containment building, but all the way through to groundwater and causing a massive contaminated plume. That movie was silly. None of that would happen. Reach down here, and the most common inhabitants are scavengers living off decay. This layer can be pretty cold because it's still slowly warming up from the most recent ice age. We reach bedrock, a foundation of like solid rock spiral. for all the less solid stuff above, home to fractures filled with water. It can be exposed to the surface or buried hundreds of meters below stuff. Here in the dense bedrock, we're in a weird planet inside the planet, the most thrilling zone of the deep biosphere. As we drill further down, temperatures gradually begin to rise, and soon it gets That's really huge. hot and the pressure rises. Underneath 400 meters of rock, the pressure is similar to the surface of Venus. We drill faster now, down to 1,000 meters, deeper than the Burj Khalifa is tall. Having to engineer heat shielding and pressure shielding, not unlike that in a pressurized water reactor. Coolant temperature is on the order of 600 degrees Fahrenheit, and pressure is on the order of 2250 PSI. So they're basically designing a pressure vessel like that to go underground. It's about 30 degrees Celsius, and there's almost no free oxygen left. That's the other thing. We continue and it's not only stop almost four kilometers down. 
above us wow. pressing solid rock weighing tens of thousands of tons with pressures as intense as at the bottom of the Mariana Trench. Down here... But you're not as deep because it's all rocky, sure. It's on average 120 degrees Celsius, even hotter if a magma plume is now nearby. The heat is a leftover from Earth's formation and from the decay of radioactive elements like thorium and uranium that... What? <laughs> I might need a minute. <laughs> Why? Shower the crust and it's And it jiggles! <laughs> Okay, so neither uranium nor thorium are green glowy stuff. They're just boring metal that looks like this. But I I don't even know what to say about that. I guess it's a joke with uranium butt. I guess it's a butt of a lot of their jokes involve making it some green glowy thing, as well as a lot of media. You could also argue it's the ass end of the periodic table, with the highest atomic number of anything natural. Maybe even a reference to the planet Uranus. Let me know why you think Ertzgazat did that down in the comments below. Interesting the thing though, Uranium-238 hasn't even gone through one half-life during the lifespan of the Earth, so it lasts a long time. Constant wave of radioactivity. To make things worse, some rocks are mixed with extreme amounts of salt. Hell. And right after that, we got terrifying SpongeBob. So we're talking about life underground. Not impossible for radioisotopes to cause radiolysis of water. That's when radioactive material splits water particles, producing hydrogen that microbes could use for energy. Definitely a concept that comes up with nuclear waste management and radiation interactions with water because after all, most nuclear power plants use water as a coolant. And yet, life is thriving inside rock. If we zoom in, we see that solid rock is not actually solid. It's traversed by cracks, voids, and tiny pores. Sandstone, True. limestone, or basalt are so porous that up to 40% of their volume is actually empty space. That's true of a lot of things. You zoom in far enough, you're mostly empty space. So when you give someone a hug, are you actually touching them? But even much denser rocks like granite can be split open by cracks and fractures. Yeah, granite can be fractured. You don't want to take it for granted. And granite is radioactive. They mention uranium and thorium. Those eventually decay into radon gas. And that, in high concentrations, can be dangerous. Though in most cases, radiation levels are pretty low. On the order of 0.1 microsieverts per hour from a slab of granite. Compare that to 2,000, 2,500 microsieverts per year that the average person gets from background radiation. We've found a gigantic planet-spanning system of microcaves. Free real estate filled free with water estate. and hardcore microbes. And these caves are moving. Just like the atmosphere is constantly mixing air to create weather, <laughs> down here rocks are mixing to create rock weather. It's a lot slower Submerged though. Submerged mountain ranges are shifting and ripping, crashing and merging. Way slower. Continents smash into each other with the energy of millions of nuclear weapons, but as- Okay, what is with them this episode? Nasty smashing fingernails resulting in nuclear explosions. That, okay. Slow as your fingernails grow. Countless tiny and not so tiny earthquakes rip open tiny new fissures and passageways, creating new spaces for life and closing others off forever. In this hot, moving pressure cooker, minerals are forged and baked, and organic molecules are created and Love destroyed. Music, An insane menu for anyone brave enough to try to survive down here. Le Extremophiles that had evolved to withstand high pressure. Let's venture into the system of tiny caves and meet some of them. The most extreme living things. <laughs> we we think that octillions of microbes live down here, and naturally they are pretty hardcore. The doomsday preppers of the underworld. Some have big, bulky genomes, living entirely on their own, basically forming their own ecosystem. Like the bacterium, diesel foridus. Gotta have low density to survive under this pressure, yeah. <laughs> Ordex Viator. It synthesizes its own food by nibbling carbon or sulfur from the rock and turning it into organic substances. If the conditions get too extreme, or if there's no food around, it kills itself to survive by forming an endospore. Kills itself out to survive. Uh, not a biologist, so I think I'll let the biologist explain that one to me down in the comments. It divides into a big and a small part and swallows the small part again, forming a cell within a cell. 
The outer cell then sheds its water and Recycling kills itself, leaving the spore to float around, maybe for thousands of years, until it finds a good place to spring to life again. Essentially a reset button. But yeah, down here you'd have to rely on chemosynthesis instead of photosynthesis because there's just not much in the way of light. Others like some company, like the Archaea, with the clunky name Artiarchaeum haliconexum, oh, that have a rare double membrane covered in weird materials that protect them against the extremes. They shoot out nano-sized grappling hooks to tether themselves and seem to live in cracks and fissures filled with water completely devoid of oxygen, <laughs> harvest carbon dioxide to create biomass, and may sort of eat hydrogen. The conditions sure. in the deep hydrogen that you get from the hydrolysis of this I was going to say groundwater, but we're deeper than that. Biosphere are so harsh that other microbes share the hard work by forming consortia. They knit themselves together in a biofilm, a very thin, sticky net that shields them against the extremes. They are miniature cells, often with a small genome, but each good at one thing. One type of microbe eats methane and excretes its electrons. A second type eats these electrons and converts sulfate into sulfite that's then eaten by a third microbe, and so on. It was just kind of a mutually beneficial community. And again, all relying on these chemical processes as opposed to, say, photosynthesis. Some eat iron, others use electrons to turn nitrogen or carbon dioxide into biomass. Life down yep, here. There it is. Love their artwork, but they're they're getting a little crazy with this one. Found ways to use stuff that's poisonous to most animals to make food and energy. Green glowing hamburgers. Would I expect anything less from Chris Kazan? But still, life is incredibly hard, and resources and energy are super hard to come by. So the most intense strategy for survival down here is to live forever. Like monks who've taken a vow of poverty, deep microbes consume very little and conserve their energy. Their metabolism is up to a million times slower than microbes at the surface. Wow. They had a meal when you were born and are still digesting it for most of their life. So they live for like thousands of years or something? I mean, I guess if your energy demand is that low and you're just operating in this scarcity mindset, I guess you could exist for an extended period of time. Don't know if I'd call that living. They exist in a slow They're limbo. Some even slowly cannibalize themselves until a sudden influx of resources arrives by pure chance and then they spring into action and reproduce. With this lifestyle, it's... Okay, they're clearly playing the long game here. Seems that extreme microbes can live for centuries, maybe even for millions of years. Really? If they're not hunted to death, of course. Because kilometers deep in limestone hmm. habitats, there seem to be space... Interesting, though, about them living for millions of years. I guess this would be a creature that would need to be aware of extremely long-lived nuclear waste products. They're probably well protected though. Something like that with a fairly not complicated DNA repair scheme that evolved to live around various uranium butt deposits. <laughs> Might be all right. This is big enough for multicellular predators. We've found asexual worms, 100 times longer than microbes, hunting and devouring bacteria. It's not clear if they originated down here, or if many earthquakes opened up fractures for water to carry them into the deep. But there are other fierce predators like rotifers or arthropods in the depths, hunting immortal microbes. We wish we could tell you more insane things about life in the deep biosphere, but there's a problem. We don't know that much yet. For one, sure. we can't really get a good <laughs> look at the kilometers of rock. There, huh? Drilling down could contaminate the samples with microbes from the surface. We've found living ones in deep mines and brought them into the lab. But it's pretty hard to simulate the conditions they feel comfy in, in boiling hot water. Could put them in a nuclear reactor. Those kind of extreme conditions. Though, if they evolve and adapt on very slow timescales that live for millions of years, it might take us a while to observe them and figure out what they're doing. Squeezed under mountains, submerged in deadly chemicals, and still see Here them comes through the a microscope. Stuff. And the microbes live so slowly, for so long, that nothing might happen. Yeah, that's what a I was thinking. A lot of what we know about them we got from turning them into a slurry and looking at what their genes could do, like breathing nitrogen or eating methane. We know that the diversity of life in the... I've always pronounced it as methane, but it's probably a regional thing. ...deep biosphere must be staggering and that some of the most hardcore and extreme beings live down there. This is a proper frontier of science, super hard to study, and most of what we know we've learned in just the last 20 years. There is so much more under... I didn't realize that it was a relatively new field of 
biology, at least compared to studying stuff at the surface. Discovered mystery for us that could bring us progress in medicine, energy, the climate, and more. Let's end by moving our gaze from the inside to the outside again. Since we now know how extremely large the deep biosphere is and how life down there survives without light, oxygen, sane temperatures, or not being covered in poison, could there be deep biospheres oh, all over the universe? Maybe all you need is a planet or moon with internal with heat or radiation system. and a chemical composition that allows microbes to build the parts they need. Some scientists suggest there could be 10 of them in the solar system hiding beneath a seemingly dead and frozen surface. So, and I guess that's possible, especially if you're not relying on photosynthesis. You could be pretty far away from the sun, because again, like any other radiation source, inverse square law, double your distance from the source, intensity drops by a factor of four. So photosynthesis or solar panels, way less effective on, say, Mars than it is on Earth. As we learn more and more about the life below our feet, we may accidentally learn about life in the universe. That was a fun one. Again, they were pretty crazy with the animations here. I was not expecting jiggling uranium booty. But thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.